Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, press briefing, uh, which uh, is about the launch of a very important collaboration uh, involving the public, the private, and civil society, which is at the ethos of the platform of the World Economic Forum. This is the launch of the Global Battery Alliance. This is a pretty interesting innovation uh, where big technology, mining, manufacturing, auto, and energy companies are joining forces with the OECD, UNICEF, the African Development Bank, and other international organizations and NGOs to try and rethink the global supply chain of batteries to create a responsible alliance around batteries in a market that is set to be worth over $100 billion by 2025. You'll have seen the fourth industrial revolution uh, kind of concept that the World Economic Forum has identified for this massive change in the combination of science and technology and how it's transforming businesses and governments. <laughs> what we often don't think about is what powers that revolution. Obviously, mindsets, creativity, innovation, but in a very practical sense, batteries power that revolution. Not just batteries in a cell phone, but batteries in a car. Not just batteries in a car, but soon batteries in your home, batteries in the workplace. And that is the heart of this alliance, because many of us don't realize what goes in to a battery, or what happens to a battery. Some of those who form this alliance absolutely do, and that's what we're going to find out some more about. What's the problem? Why is there a need for an alliance? And what is it going to do as we launch it? So I'm delighted to welcome just a terrific panel of uh, speakers, the champions, uh, if you like, of this, of this alliance. Um, and to my left is Benedict Sobotka, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Eurasian Resources Group. Um, then we have, um, uh, next to him, uh, Marcos Bonturi, who's a Special Representative to the United Nations OECD um, here in New York and for the United Nations. Um, then we have um, Takayuki Morita-san, who's the Executive Vice President and the Chief Global Officer for the NEC Corporation in Japan. Welcome. And then finally, but by no means least, is Jane Nelson, who many of you know is a Director of Corporate Responsibility Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard University. And may I point out that there are a number of champions um, in the audience um, from NGOs such as uh, PACT and, and others who have been working hard on this battery alliance, and we might call on you uh, uh, to offer some thoughts as we go through the discussion. Um, but first of all, um, uh, Benedict, if I can turn to you as um, someone who I remember uh, almost perhaps a, a year or so ago uh, came to, I was at the World Economic Forum and said, you know what, I think we have a pretty important issue that requires much more attention and perhaps the building of a new kind of collaboration to help solve some of the problems. And if I may say so, under your leadership uh, and your astute knowledge of how to build collaborations in this space, we are now here today with a pretty wide-ranging alliance um, for global battery improvement. So perhaps you could tell us, um, sir, what is the problem as far as you see it, and what are you hoping that this new alliance will achieve? Thank you, Dominic. Are you giving me far too much credit for the, the alliance? After all, this is a, an alliance of the World Economic Forum, which we thought uh, is probably the platform best suited for being successful. This is a topic I'm incredibly passionate about and have been for, for several years. Um, we all use batteries in our daily life, and I think, Dominic, you've put that very rightly, and we're going to use them more and more. But no one really knows what goes into those batteries. We know because we're one of the largest producers of cobalt. Cobalt is a product that goes into your battery because it's very energy intense, very dense. It keeps a lot of energy. So there's no Tesla without a lithium-ion battery, and my colleagues from NSC will, will uh, be able to contribute much more. They know much more about batteries than I do. Um, and that cobalt predominantly is mined in um, places like the DRC. The DRC is a, um, is a very poor country, um, and it has a, a tremendous problem with artisanal mining. Now, our mines are large industrial scale production <coughs> sites, um, but when we use, when we go around and look what is around our sites, when we see what, what happens in the country, there's thousands and thousands of children mining in artisanal mining sites. Cobalt that it then ends up in your smartphone, ends up in your electric vehicle, ends up in your home storage. There is not a single 
phone in this world that does not contain cobalt that has been mined by children. Why? Because there's no traceability in the supply chain. The product gets mined, it gets sent then to converters in Asia, mainly in China, where all the materials blend in with different products from different parts of the world, and it ends up in a battery. So it's actually completely impossible at this point to be 100% certain that no children has been involved in mining this material. So for me, this is very, a very important point because I'm, I, I see it every day. I mean, I go to the DRC as part of my job. We have 15,000 people in the country. And I go on a, on a regular basis and I see it. You fly, with the, you fly over these sites and you see thousands of people digging with their bare hands in the dirt. And cobalt is not a mineral that you want to touch, particularly if you're four years old. Um, I think there have been some reports out and video been taken. I think Sky News did an excellent report about where the children are used in the mines. It's terrible. I mean, how can the electrification, the, the, the revolution that is taking place today in the space of batteries, how can that be based on child labor? How can the 21st, 22nd century technology be based on 19th century work practices? It's something that needs to stop. So for me, this is a, a topic that really goes to my heart. For us, we try to do a lot um, on the ground. We, we sponsor schools for about 9,500 uh, children. We've just signed a three-year agreement with, uh, to support um, the Good Shepherd Sister that work around um, uh, artisanal mines and how uh, women and children in particular and female and girls are treated in those artisanal mining sites. Um, but we're just one company in that whole space. So how do you bring all these players in the supply chain together? You have to bring both the public and the private sector together. This problem is too big for, for all of us alone. So we have to come together. And um, what is exciting about this, because it actually goes from the whole value chain. It goes from the people that, like us, we produce metal from the ground. It goes to the converters, the, the manufacturers in Asia and China and Europe. It then ends up um, in your, your end customer's product that we all touch every single day when we wake up. The first thing we do in the morning, I guess, I mean, I do it, I guess you all do it, you touch your mobile phone, right? <laughs> Which means you are touching a product that has gone through all this massive supply chain. And uh, so it touches our lives and it will touch more and more for the next, for the next uh, decades. It's going to be incredibly important. So this value chain approach, and then the best, the best platform to use is, we, 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 we agree, I mean, this, the, the World Economic Forum has done an incredible job in bringing together a first coalition. I remember in the beginning of 2016, at Davos 16, we had a, I mean, just perfect time, and sometimes the stars are just aligned, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, had, uh, we had Amnesty International coming up with a report saying that 60,000 children are working in the cobalt supply chain at the DRC. 60,000 children. That's incredible. And of course, that brought a lot of momentum. Suddenly, the, the, the companies downstream in the value chain and the, the colleagues from BSF and, and EC, they, they know what I'm talking about. They suddenly got more aware of the problem um, and something has to be done about it. So it's, it, the stars were aligned for this to be successful. I'm incredibly excited that we've got this, this group together here, that we've got this formal announcement. And I would like to see the entire industry from the miners to the end users of the product to be involved in this and to make it a success and to make real impact on the ground for the children that are involved in the supply chain of, of cobalt, but also battery materials in, in general. Thank you. Benedict, thank you. And thank you for your, for your leadership in this space. And I think you kind of um, sketched out um, pretty much the, the, the vision there, which is it's not a one company issue. This is a global supply chain, hundreds of billions of dollars, which is set to grow enormously over the coming decades, but with roots and as you very eloquently put a sort of 19th century start point, it can't work. That feels such a sort of disjunct when we hear about technologies and fast moving connectivity. Um, in terms of this supply chain and the, the battery value chain, if we look at, um, at how that connects together and maybe from the uh, industries in DRC and the challenges of cobalt, if we move to the electronics and energy storage industry. Uh, Takeyuki Murata-san from NEC Corporation, you are a large energy storage business. You know, batteries are an important enabler to what you do and demand for energy storage is growing so strongly. How are you linked to what Benedict um, just set out and why are you part of this alliance and what do you uh, want to see happen from such a collaboration? Um, NEC has been involved in this uh, development and since its early days. And uh, we see the uh, great potential of this uh, technology. And today we see a lot of people talking about uh, electric vehicle 
and uh, application of uh, uh, renewable energies and uh, energy storage in the grid environment. So uh, I think uh, uh, it's very essential uh, for us to use like uh, energy storage or energy battery and uh, in order to achieve very clean uh, energy environment. So uh, I think we need to uh, build up like a very healthy uh, development or environment and uh, which assure the uh, very healthy and circular uh, economy around this. So uh, uh, I don't think any single company can achieve uh, these objectives. Uh, we really need to revisit the current uh, regulatory environment and uh, standardization and also business model. And in order to uh, realize all the things, uh, we really need the collaborations between uh, public and private and uh, to harmonize and uh, all the things and uh, face the difficulties and also the opportunities. I see the opportunities in front of us. In order to capture these uh, opportunities, we really need to uh, build up uh, this type of collaborations. Thank you, Marita san I mean, what is so interesting is we often think of uh, new green energy, renewable energy as clean, as the sort of future away from the dirty fossil of the past. But the illustration here is that uh, there are things that need to be cleaned up in the clean energy revolution. The battery, the storage uh, process perhaps hasn't you know, got to itself in the same way that some of the uh, more uh, radical technologies have, that we still have this footprint that goes uh, through the supply chain. And not only that, um, from what I understand as well, uh, in terms of the disposal of batteries, a lot of e-waste and a lot of battery waste, and all of those uh, uh, minerals and chemicals in batteries um, are not so good leaching out into the ground afterwards. So there's a whole supply chain problem. Do you see, Marita san that there are many Japanese companies and interest from others in the uh, ecosystem of industry in Japan that are also aware of and keen to engage in this issue? Yes, yes. Uh, um, we uh, uh, watched uh, these opportunities and uh, since uh, uh, early days, um, especially uh, in the case of lithium-ion batteries, different from the acid and others, it lasts long. And uh, normally it lasts uh, 10 years, or some cases it lasts uh, 20, 30 years. So we really need to think out uh, how we can reuse or uh, uh, refurbish and uh, uh, remodeling uh, those type of things. And so uh, many uh, industries and the people and the colleagues are thinking about uh, those type of things. Uh, but in order to accelerate these things, we really need to uh, uh, review our current regulatory environment and also the, uh, sometimes we need some uh, incentive uh, with which uh, people uh, can be uh, encouraged or motivated and to grow their initiatives. That's, I think, uh, uh, what we really need to do. Thank you. Um, it's fascinating that the lithium battery, was it 20 years or something? It lasts a long time. Yes. And yet uh, you've probably seen, ladies and gentlemen, this research that suggests, at least to the United States, that uh, uh, on average a smartphone is, is kind of used for about a couple of years, 24 months, two years, and then discarded. So this contradiction between how long the battery would last, having been disposed of, versus how quickly we are turning around our use of uh, these appliances is something to be thought through um, very carefully. Now, you've mentioned several times there um, about uh, policy, incentives, regulatory environment, and I think that gets to the heart of um, the vision of this as being a public and private uh, uh, partnership. We have 
uh, many other industries involved. Obviously, we have colleagues from BASF and others who are, who are here and championing this. But uh, if I can turn to Marcus Bonturi, um, you are a, a, you know, one of the leadership group of the OECD. Uh, and one would expect, perhaps, um, a, a resistance to be engaged in alliance. And in fact, the firm law of regulation to be, <laughs> to be put in place. So um, how interesting is it to be involved uh, in an alliance um, with some of these companies who are struggling with these issues? It seems confusing. <laughs> it might be that uh, you, know, you would be one of those who'd be regulating to stop it. Yet here we are in um, what seems like a very interesting um, and substantive collaboration. Absolutely. No, thank you, Dominic. I think, I think uh, this co collaboration with the private sector is in the DNA of the OECD. Now from the, is, there's, they are institutional partners, they are present in many of our committees, so, so we're very keen and we, we seek uh, very, very much uh, the participation of the private sector in, in most of the work we do. So this is not new uh, for us and, and, and it's definitely something we welcome very much. So I, I wanted to start by thanking the WEF for taking the initiative and bringing us together. It's a very worthwhile uh, endeavor. Um, and and uh, just to give you a little bit of background where the OECD comes from. Uh, uh, in, on, on this debate. Uh, we have had for many years the, the due diligence guidance for responsible mineral supply chains. Uh, it's something that all OECD countries, there are 35 OECD countries uh, today, but even some non-OECD countries have adhered to those uh, uh, um, guidelines. There are eight uh, non-OECD non members. And, uh, and this, this uh, 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 work that uh, can be applied for a number of minerals, I think uh, up until now we have not worked enough on, on the issue of lithium and cobalt, but, but it's, it's, it's been used for, for, for gold and, 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 other, and other minerals, but not for, not for this one. But I think this is very important, this initiative, that we can, we can use that as a basis for, for working together. And, and the way that the system works is indeed a multi-stakeholder uh, 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 process. We, um, um, we have that in this particular uh, 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 initiative that we're taking and in, in, in other multi-stakeholder initiatives, it's very important that we bring um, not only, of course, the regulators uh, uh, and the decision makers uh, in the public sector, but, but companies are different uh, uh, um, links in the chain. Uh, in this particular, we're, we're very, very, I've seen with, with uh, great interest, the, the, all those, those uh, new stakeholder initiatives like this one, we are bringing, of course, the companies who bought, buy the raw material, like in the DRC, like, like, like you mentioned in this particular case. The, the tr companies are buying this and transforming this, very often in this case, in China or, or other countries in Asia. And the consuming countries, uh, EU, the US, uh, Japan. So it's very important that, that we, we work together with all the, the, the elements uh, uh, of, of the chain. So we very much support all those attempts to, to carry the due diligence together. It has to be a oh, common endeavor. I think this is very, the very first message, and it can only work if we do it together. I think that's, that's the first message I'd like to leave uh, with, with you today. The, the, um, the second one, and I think uh, uh, um, my, my colleague from, from, from Japan mentioned that very, very clearly, the, the, the environmental impacts. We should, we should look at this as part of, the, of that alliance that we, we're building today. Uh, we we want to make sure that uh, there are indeed challenges uh, with, the, with the growth of, of, of the usage of those minerals, but there are opportunities as well. And, and, and from the OECD side, we're very interested to work with you to better understand how we can make and help countries make the policy frameworks conducive to, 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 to investment in, in the new capacity to, to treat, uh, uh, the, say, the, the end of life uh, uh, product. So, so we're very interested to have the dialogue with you so we can better advise our member governments on how to, to, to build that, that policy framework that is, that is indeed conducive to, 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 to I'll say, innovation in, 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 in that area. And then, uh, uh, finally, uh, 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 the issue of, uh, of extended producer responsibility is something that I would like to put on the table as well. We need to look at it uh, uh, as an established principle on environmental <coughs> policy. Uh, uh, it's been around with us for for, for almost 30 years. So again, it's something that we also can only work if we have all the, the, the main stakeholders at the table. And again, this initiative is, is exactly what we need. And I'd like to thank you very, very much from, from our point of view uh, to have brought us together. 
Marcus, thank you very much. And for those of you listening, you can see how um, deliciously interesting these things are when you have people who come at this from a policy perspective and people who come at this from a business perspective and how language is different, how viewpoints are different, but how there's a common goal attached. And this idea, which I thought was very nice that you said about actually, you know, we cannot do this alone. You know, a, a policy maker can't make policy in vacuum without understanding some of the real challenges across the supply chain, particularly given how much the innovation is moving so fast. Absolutely. But nor can any of those work without some of the understanding from the ground, uh, particularly from civil society groups or those who are really working on some of the very kind of um, particular issues which really need to be understood in quite some depth. And so this alliance that brings together the civil society, the policymaker, and companies along these global value chains, although it's hard to do, um, it sounds like from your perspective, sir, at OECD, this is the thing we must do. Absolutely. Fascinating. Fascinating. Now, um, Jane Nelson of um, Harvard Kennedy School, you're not part of this alliance yet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you have you know, a worldwide reputation for studying this kind of curious phenomenon of these alliances and collaborations which are starting to emerge. We are at the forum, the International Organization for Public-Private Collaboration, but we rely upon experts and international um, readers like you of the situation to kind of assess um, how impactful these things can be. And you've studied many of these. I mean, what would your advice be uh, to this group um, in terms of um, what it needs to achieve or to show that it is a meaningful and impactful alliance? And uh, uh, what areas do you think it should uh, particularly focus on or watch out for? Thank you, Jim. Well, 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 thank you, Dominic. And I think, I think you um, hit the nail on the head when you said these are difficult to build, um, and yet we actually don't have a choice. I think if we're going to achieve the sustainable development goals, we absolutely have to build more of these alliances. And I think there, there are three key lessons that have come out of similar alliances, and which I think the Global Battery Alliance is already um, going very much in the right direction. And first is having a very clear shared vision, but also set of goals and commitments at the global level and sort of set of principles. And I think we've got all the partners here to make that possible. And as, as all of my colleagues have already said, not only the public-private civil society dimension, but within the business community, different industry mm -hmm. sectors. And I think there's That's fantastic work going on in the mining sector around sustainable development, fantastic work going on in the electronics sector, but to get mining and electronics and utilities and automotives together around a specific value chain has enormous potential. And likewise with the non-governmental organizations, getting human rights organizations and environmental and development NGOs together with government and business. So first of all, having this, this global coalition that has already identified a very clear vision and, and goal, and now I think the challenge is, well, what are the commitments that the companies are going to make? You know, what, are the, what are going to be the, the policy commitments and incentive commitments that governments will make and the commitments that the NGOs will make at the global level? So that's sort of challenge number one, and you know, so a vision with some clear goals and commitments. I think secondly, so importantly, is that on the ground, action and implementation. And again, already I know the Alliance is talking about focusing on specific countries and specific issues in, the, in those countries. So your child labor in the DRC, getting the local partners together with some of that global support to achieve action on the ground and, and you know, clear again, very specific deliverables and goals on the ground. And then thirdly, I think an Alliance like this has enormous potential to then hold each other to account. Oh, that's interesting. And mutual accountability. So you've got your, your global vision and set of commitments and sort of uh, shared commitments and demands of each other. Then there's the on-the-ground implementation and action. And then you can bring it back up both on the ground but also to the global level to say, well, have we achieved our goals? Has government done what we call government to do? Have we as the, you know, the mining sector done our bit? Have the electronic sector done our bit? You know, how have the NGOs contributed? And, um, and, and you know, hold each other to account in ways that go way beyond regulation um, you know, to a, a you know, shared set of responsibilities and, and, and results. And I, you know, I do think that the, the Global Battery Alliance has another enormous um, contribution to make, and that most of the alliances that we've seen in agriculture and water and energy are sort of retrofitting social and environmental 
um, management and due diligence onto well-established, long-term uh, global value chains. And the battery value chain, obviously, you know, it's been around for a long time, but all the, the dramatic new innovations that are happening, the new technologies, which are going to be truly transformative to actually embed a strong commitment to social and environmental and good governance issues at the outset of this massive growth in a global value chain, I think has enormous potential. And as Benedict and uh, several other com colleagues also said, it's not just about doing no harm on the ground, but you know, how can we ensure that their livelihoods for artisanal yeah. miners, for various people along the value chain, um, uh, uh, people doing recycling, uh, so at both ends of the value chain, where there, there are opportunities to be not only more sustainable and innovative, but also more inclusive of low-income producers, consumers, and, and, and end users. Thank you. So insightful. I mean, this idea of intentionality to an alliance, you can't just have an alliance. It's got to do yes, something absolutely. with a specific goal by a specific time. And when you were talking about uh, mutual accountability, I noticed that all of our panel and many in the audience were all writing that down. Um, it's exactly that sort of construct which I think will create a, create a vibrant scene. In terms of this uh, uh, practical action, um, it might be, some, for some of us, it might be a bit abstract. So what is, you know, as a bunch of companies and organizations and international people, what does it do? Well, you know, for those of you who ever try to construct a project that is meaningful, um, the ability to bring together different actors um, to kind of then focus in an issue and raise the resources and get something done, but be part of a broader movement so that it's not just in one place, it could happen again and again and again. There's a difference, we might call it a program and a project of these days sometimes a platform um, and a project. And um, I'm very well aware, it's very exciting, that some of the members of the Alliance have a particular focus, as Benedict, you were saying, in the, in the DRC, are already coming together and leveraging some of those combined um, um, resources, the African Development Bank, some country um, knowledge, packed, if I understand it, from uh, the civil society community to start working on one of those particular problem areas. I don't know if Benedict or um, I think Mark, you're, you're in the audience of one, two would like to talk about that. Because it's quite important, as you say, Jane, that there are some practical developments. Yeah, I, I would imagine there's, there's, in the room here, and there's no disagreement about the why, right? We have got to fix the problem. We're still debating a little bit about the what and what the targets are and what the commitments are going to be. And they're going to be tangible. And they need to be hard financial commitments as well, because no money. Yeah. No honey, as they say, so <laughs> there's no money you spend on the ground, you will never create alternative livelihoods. And that's just a fact of life. But the how, I think, is the very important part, is how do we now translate sustainable, sustainable development goals, translate the, the great why that we all agree on, how do we translate in, that into, into impact on the ground? So how do we deploy funds in countries like the DRC? How do we uh, get children to school? How do we create alternative livelihoods for their parents so they don't have to go to the mines. How do we uh, bring a long-term, and it's an interesting anecdote actually, uh, the schools we have, 9,500 students, it costs us less than $10 million to do that. Right? That's probably the profit of one of the big electronics company per minute. I'm exaggerating now, but it's, it's not a huge amount of money required to fix these issues. But you have to do it in an environment that is very challenging. Right? And it's very difficult to deploy funds in countries uh, that, are, that, are, that are struggling. And I think that's where uh, organizations, NGOs that have a foot on the ground, the PACTs, the, the Good Shepherd Sisters, UNICEF, they've got infrastructure on the ground. Combined with our infrastructure, we, obviously we, have, we build roads, we build power plants, infrastructure that you need then to go and deploy these, um, uh, these initiatives, um, th where they have to work together. And at the moment, it's still very much piecemeal. We do all the... We do small things and we do small and the bigger things together, but it's not coordinated. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of funds to have a measurable impact on the livelihoods of people that currently work in the battery supply chain. So interesting. Some people kind of call this a systemic change that actually rather than just little micro projects, you can come together um, and make bigger change happen across a whole global value chain, but with specific actors working on specific problems at different bits of the value chain. Um, um, Mark, I don't know if you want to um, have, I don't know if you have a yeah. microphone in the audience to help you. 
and maybe introduce who you are. Cause yeah, my name is Mark Fizo, and I'm the CEO of an organization called PACT. And we've been working in 40 countries around the world, but extractive industries is a real um, uh, focus of ours. And we've been working on tin tungsten tantalum in the Great Lakes area on traceability and social and economic and environmental issues. And now I've been involved uh, with the Global Battery uh, Alliance. Uh, two things I'd like to share, uh, coming off what Benedict says, is you know, it, it can be frustrating to, to build an alliance because those of us, like my friend Gary Haugen here from in, uh, IJM, you know, we're doers. We're in the field. We rub shoulders with the miners. I myself have been down in the mines. And, and you want to you move to action. And, and we have to keep the, 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 the urgency of that now, first and foremost in our minds, in our hearts, but we also need to be smart. And so one of the things that is going to happen in uh, October, November is um, good design. So we're going to have an in-country design uh, session in the DRC, mostly to make sure we know what that what should be and how we should make what should be happen in an intelligent, inclusive way. Um, and that last part, inclusive, is none of this works unless it's owned by the local organizations, the local populations, and the national and local governments. And PACT is already working with the DRC interministerial group and have, uh, have designed uh, frameworks to support their their, their five-year plan of, of, of doing the types of things around cobalt and child labor specifically, which I think is the key entry point. And after entering that child labor, you can have these concentric circles. The last thing I'd say is once we get working and now that we have this integrated, holistic, courageous group <laughs> of policymakers and governments and the business community, it's very courageous that they're stepping forward. I'm, I'm deeply impressed. Um, it can be done. This is something we should pick up because it can be done. It's been done in the in the ten, ten, uh, the three T's, in the Great Lakes, and, and all it takes to your idea of the platform is to adapt, adopt, and replicate. That's it. It's right there. We have the will, and now we just got to get our act together and, and do it. And and it can be done. So shame on us if we don't pick it up. Uh, yeah. Mark, thank you so much, and again, thank you for the leadership that uh, that you've shown. I think we've got time for like a, if anybody's got a question. Um, or two, um, please uh, uh, in front of me, tell us who you are and uh, what your question is and whether there's a particular person you want to direct it to. Um. Oh, that's, that's hard. <laughs> um, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Jane. My name is Irene, Irene Hell. I report for Newsweek Middle East. And I'm so glad that I have something I can catch on because this is really your doers. Uh, it's really a, a wonderful example how. Um, how something is getting off the ground and have significant impact on the lives of many people. And um, so uh, maybe you can give me a little bit more information on this Global um, Battery Alliance, who is go going to recharge the UN goals now, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Very good. Um, yeah. th thank you. Um, so there is some sort of material available, I think, which will give you some, some facts and figures. Um, I don't know if anybody from the, from the panel wants to offer you know, a few Useful things. Well, or? I was very interested what you just said. Uh, that um, it is, uh, it, it's always interesting how it all comes together. Everybody outside who is not in your elitist circle says, "Oh, they just talk. You are nothing that's getting done. Oh, World Economic Forum. They just show their beautiful uh, tailored suits." And um, but this is a wonderful example that you really get something done. So uh, this um, having the um, Secretary General of um, Amnesty speaking to the business leaders. Um, so um, what actually happened after that? Is this uh, Global Battery Alliance a spin-off of this meeting? Or this is something I, I could really explain to all our readers uh, that it's really um, not just uh, looking good and being important. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for the compliment to all of us for looking good. <laughs> 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 um, but maybe, so it's a very, very um, good question. Maybe Benedict, I mean, you know, what, what triggered this? Um, well, we've been aware of this problem for, for the last 10 years. I mean, in the countries we operate, artisanal mining is a fact of life because there's nothing else to do, right? Usually during the dry season, they come and mine, and during the wet season, they, they harvest their crops and plant their crops. So it's very seasonal. So the, the, the problem in, of artisanal mining is a, is a, is a well-known problem, but has never been actually linked directly to the electric electrification, let's say the electric revolution or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think the, the fact that we now can actually link it to your actual mobile phone and that we can link it to your electric vehicle um, and to your power wall at home, I think it's very tangible, right? So it's very abstract if you talk about these social problems in Africa. 
they're very far away. And people don't have to see them, and if they don't want to see them, they can avoid them. Right? You don't have to watch Sky News reports on artisanal mining in Africa. Right? You can avoid it. But the fact that it's in your face, the first thing you touch in the morning, you turn on that, that electric vehicle driving to work, you are going to touch it. And I think that's a, that's a point where when the Amnesty Industrial Report came out, the end user industries, they started, I wouldn't call it panicking, but they started to, to see that we've got a bigger problem here that we were maybe thinking it didn't exist or maybe we're trying to avoid because the response to the Amnesty International report was quite interesting. They requested comments from the end customers and the end users of batteries. And I mean, we're one of the largest producers in, in the world, and, but we're not that large that when all these people responded and said, where do you buy your cobalt from? They all said, we buy from our company or from, from one of our competitors. If you add all this up, it's impossible, right? They don't buy from us, it's impossible, which means those companies through secondaries and tertiary intermediaries, they buy from artisanal mines, right? You can't avoid it. So I think the Amnesty Nash report was a trigger point. And then, of course, we'd, at Davos, it was, it was voted or elected one of the 10 initiatives uh, of Davos 2017. Um, so I think there were a number of trigger points. And at the same time, the industry is changing dramatically. I mean, we've got a, a, an automotive company a week announcing that they're going to convert that many series into, mm. into electric vehicles. And we're going to go all electric by 2028 20, or 27, 29. I mean, I don't know the automotive space very well, but that's, that's a revolution. When, an entire industry, one of the top five industries in the world, starts to think about what is going to be my product in 15 years from now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we could carry on this conversation for quite some time. There's a lot to get one's teeth into. Um, there's many more things going on. I think there's even another press conference that wants to come in. So I'm going to draw this to a close. But you can see from the passion uh, in the group here and from some of our interventions and the materiality of the issue. Um, the image that you leave us with, sir, of every morning when you wake up and you touch your, your smartphone or when you get in that electric car, we have to clean that up because that sort of connectivity is not just a connectivity for us to be in touch on social networks or through the Internet of Things, but there's a connectivity from the mine all the way through to the consumer. And that's a real change. Um, in mindset. Um, we're delighted at the World Economic Forum to host and do what we can to help advance this fantastic global battery alliance. We're delighted it was launched today at the uh, Impact Summit for Sustainable Development. It touches multiple sustainable development goals. We're delighted with the engagement of UNICEF, the African Development Bank, the OECD, um, multiple civil society groups, some of whom have been represented here, and others. I think we're at kind of 45 stakeholders and growing, so there will be more information for those who want to find it on our website and such. Um, with that, if I may take your indulgence, I'd just like to close and thank the champions of this alliance. It is a brave step, um, as was said um, by one of our um, um, audience members here, but without a bit of bravery, you can't get a champion. Without a champion, you can't get change. And if anything the SDGs are trying to tell us to do, it is to change. So thank you so much. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll pledge ourselves to come back in 12 months' time at next year's Impact Summit with some achievements and progress along the way. With that, uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.